Well, welcome to our uh, second installment on the book of Revelation. I figure we'll be in Revelation for about two quarters or so. So that's moving at a pretty decent pace, but not, uh, not lingering too awfully long on any one part. And last week we started an introduction of the book, sort of following a deductive approach where we try to figure out, okay, what, what is this book about overall? Try to establish a framework. And then we're going to go back and go chapter by chapter and, and study this book. You think the, do you think the book of Revelation can be understood? <laughs> Yeah, you get, a, you get a variety of answers there. But remember what was written to us in chapter 1 and verse 3, written to those at that time who needed to know this information. What did Jesus say? Yes, blessed is he who reads and who hear and who understands the things which are written in it. So did Jesus give people something that was impossible to understand? No, it was something that they could understand and know. It was something they needed to know. Um, and so it is something that we can understand. Maybe not every detail, but we're going to understand a lot. I'm convinced of that. And we started looking at um, seven keys to understanding the book <clears throat> last week. And I'll put those up on the screen for you. Very important is, is the first one. Revelation is written in symbols. It's symbolic language. It's apocalyptic language. Um, and so we're going to take things figuratively for the most part, unless it's very, very obvious that it's to be taken literally. And well, we said there are other books in the Bible that are like this, right? And if we know our Old Testaments, you see the books of Daniel, Zechariah, Ezekiel, parts of Isaiah, parts of other books are written in a very similar style to what we see in Revelation. And uh, that helps us to understand this is figurative. It's, it's uh, apocalyptic language in the sense that you have what is written, but then underneath that you have what it means. Now, one of the keys that's not up here that I find very helpful is don't speculate, right? That's, that's the uh, temptation is to kind of go overboard and, and uh, start speculating, well, this, this means that and this means this, when oftentimes the book itself will tell you what the symbols mean. And there are some very um, important symbols that we've begun to decode, I guess you could say, in order to get the main characters. If you think of this book as a drama that's played out between good and evil, we can get the main characters in this drama. And that helps us a lot to understand the book as a whole. So the book is written in symbols. Revelation, this is also critical. Number two, it's about events that will shortly come to pass. How do we know that? It says so. The book tells us, right? In the very first verse. And if we don't get this, we can badly go astray in our interpretation of the book. Look at verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. When someone says to you, something is going to happen soon, what is your first thought, naturally, is your first thought, well, this will happen in 2,000 plus years or soon. Some, it was something that was going to happen in the near future. He says it again in verse 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it. Why? For the time is near. The time is near. We saw at the end of the book, he says the same thing to us. 
He tells John, don't seal up the words of this prophecy. Why? Because it was about to happen. It was about to go down. And these people that he's writing to needed to know what was about to happen. So if we can't get that in our minds, in the very first verse, uh, we can go badly off track. It's about events that will shortly come to pass. Number three, it's given to comfort persecuted Christians. There's a lot about persecution. And, of course, Jesus' goal is to bring comfort, to bring encouragement, to bring help to these persecuted Christians. Number four, it identifies the dragon, the first beast, and the second beast. I wanted to go ahead and, and talk about this because uh, if we wait, it's going to be not until chapter 12 that we start to see some of these main characters in the book. The dragon, the first beast or the sea beast, and the second beast, which is a land beast. Now, just from last time, who is the dragon? How do you know that the dragon is Satan? <laughs> I didn't tell you. No, no, I didn't tell you. How do we know? It's written in the book. The book itself tells us. We don't need to speculate. It tells us. Uh, let, me, let me show you. We'll come back to the list here in a second. Who is the dragon? Well, we find out in chapter 12. You have this imagery of this great red dragon who's very angry and he's about to eat this child that's being born. We'll get into all those details when we get to chapter 12. But who is the dragon? And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan. It just comes right out and tells you. No need to wonder. And he says it again in chapter 20. Yeah, it's a great question. Why does he say it in such vague language and then, and then tell you what it means? Well, some have speculated, and I don't think there's any proof for this, that Christians were, or, or Christ was wanting to reveal this to his bond servants without everyone else in the world knowing necessarily what's going on. But he explains a lot of it, doesn't he? Maybe people would give up by then. I don't know. I really don't know the answer to that other than to say that it's written in this style that's very common in the Old Testament. Who is the first beast? Now, remember, remember who this is. Come to chapter 13. What was, what was the beast like? How was he described, just briefly? The first beast. Look at... Yeah, he's made up of these four animals, right? What else do you know about him? How many heads? Seven heads. How many horns? Ten. Well, this must be a ten-nation federation of the European Union, right? Here we go, off the deep end. Just wait. Just keep reading. Keep reading. Don't speculate. Who is the first beast? Let me take this away. I'm going to ask you without, without uh, Scripture up there yet. Who is the first beast? It's the Roman Empire, right? How do we know that? Well, it's not quite as explicit this time as with the dragon. But here's what he says. If you go over to chapter 17, uh, and we get clues in 13 as well, but as you go over to chapter 17, it becomes very clear who the first beast is. This is Revelation 17, 7. And the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I will tell you. Right? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast which carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. And so what does he tell John? Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman, the woman sits. And they are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. You learn a lot from that verse. What do the seven heads of the beast represent, first of all? 
Right? Let's take the other one first. But you're right. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Seven hills you may have. Does that ring a bell with anyone? Would that have rung a bell to first century people? The city on seven hills? It's Rome. It's always known as Rome. That was, that's, the, that's the folklore about Rome. That's what everyone knew about Rome. It's, even today, you can just Google it. Go to Wikipedia, and it like, talks about Rome as the city on seven hills. And they, they would have known that. Yeah, probably so. Yeah, probably would be hard for someone not familiar with this kind of biblical language. So what else do the seven heads represent? Seven kings. Okay, so we don't have to wonder. Seven kings. Which kings? Future kings? Past kings? He says five have fallen. One is. Now what does that tell you? He's in power as John writes in the first century. And who was in power as John writes in the first century? Not Julius, but yeah, it was the emperors. The emperors of Rome. Yeah. One is. And there's a lot more you can get out of this verse that we'll talk about when we get to this in full. I think we can probably pinpoint when John is writing from this clue here. But the beast, the first beast that comes out of the sea is it's the Roman Empire. Who is the second beast? We haven't talked about this yet. Come to chapter 13 again. Look at chapter 13, verse 11. This is right after the first beast is described for the first time. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. What do you gather right away from this? What do we learn about this beast? Yeah, powerful. What is this thing about looking like a lamb? What do you think that's about? Looks pretty innocent, right? But how does he speak? Speaks as a dragon. Who is who again? Satan. He's getting his, his speech, his message from the devil. Yeah, I think that's the idea here. It must, he must have seemed innocent in a way. That's how I take the horns like a lamb. But look at verse 12. He exercises all the authority of the first beast, who is, again, the Roman Empire, right? He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. What is the role of this second beast? What's the verse say? It has to do with Rome for sure. What does he what does he make the world do? Worship the first beast. So this, is, this beast is making the whole world worship the Roman Empire, the emperors of the Roman Empire. Was that a thing in the first century? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, when you look back in history, uh, we talked a little bit about this last time, that people were forced to take a pinch of incense and to burn it on the altar and say that Caesar is Lord. Christians too would have been forced to do that 
And what if they didn't do that? It means big trouble, right? It costs you dearly to not worship these emperors. And, and history tells us that there were shrines everywhere to the Roman emperors. Uh, and there were actually state priests that were, uh, I suppose you would say, employed by the Roman Empire. And they would require this worship of the emperors. And to refuse to do so was an act of treason. And so it's not as explicit here, but who might we say that this second beast is? I believe it's the cult of emperor worship. It's the power of the Roman Empire who were forcing people to worship the empire and the emperors. The second beast is the those who forced people to worship the emperors. It's the cult of emperor worship. Now there's another character in chapter 17. Flip over there. And we're going to come back and, and look at all this again as we go through the book. Yeah, that go to a shrine and worship. Right. And you know, a lot of the emperors took themselves very seriously. And not all of them claimed to be gods, and not all of them sought worship, but some of them did. Domitian was one of the main ones that he took his so-called deity very seriously. So, yes. Uh, you're not praying to the Buddha, right? Okay, good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, this was um, something that the Christians in that time were going to be facing, had faced, and were going to face again trying to be forced to worship the emperors. Uh, key number five. Um, well, I'm all discombobulated. Let me go back. Let's look at the other keys here. Number five, the book of Revelation identifies the harlot, and she is another major character in the book. And we uh, find out about who she is in chapter 17. So who is the harlot? Turn over to chapter 17 with me. Look at verse 3. And he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. Which beast is this again? It's the first one, right? The sea beast, the Roman Empire. So there's this woman sitting on top of the beast. Verse 4, The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations of the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus, when I saw her, I wondered greatly. What do you learn about this woman? First of all, where is she sitting? Yeah, over Rome. She's sitting on the beast with seven heads and ten horns. So immediately you know there's a connection with the Roman Empire. What else do you learn about the woman? Yes, and he says, this is a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Now, was Babylon a power at this time, as John writes? Used to be, right, but not anymore. Well, that's curious. That is a mystery, isn't it? Who is this Babylon? 
the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. What do you learn from verse 6? Yes, she's persecuting the saints. She has a cup with the blood of the saints and the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And then that's when the angel says, why do you wonder? I'll tell you what this is all about. Right. So come down to verse 18. The woman, this is a major clue, the woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Does he say which did reign over the kings of the earth? Does he say which will reign? What's he say? It's present, is reigning, which reigns over the kings of the earth. What is the great city that was reigning over the kings of the earth at that time? Rome. It's Rome. That's really the only answer. It's Rome. And you see this imagery of her sitting on top of the, the beast. She's on top of the Roman Empire. She's on top of the seven hills. It's the city of Rome who was the great harlot who was driving this persecution of God's people. There is a coin, as I read, in the British Museum from this time period, and guess what it has on it? A coin from Rome. It's got a luxurious woman on it. So this would not be a symbol that people of that time would be totally unfamiliar with. It was on their money, apparently. So it identifies the harlot, and we'll hit the next two keys uh, briefly, because we're going to talk about one of them a lot tonight. Number six, the book of Revelation identifies the 1260 days. This comes up, I believe it's five times in the book. And 1260 days is how long? It's 42 months. Uh, it's three and a half years. So you'll see it stated in different ways, whether it's in days or months or years. In Daniel, this time frame comes up as well when he talks about time, times, that's two, and a half time. So that's three and a half years. And uh, it always comes up in this book uh, in connection with a, a time of persecution. So it's a time, uh, I don't think it's to be literally taken as 1260 days, but it's a definite time. It's not a thousand years, right? It's not a day, but it's a time of definite persecution of the saints. So um, you look at, for example, Revelation 13, 5, and you see the beast there making war on God's people for 42 months. That's the number, 1260 days or three and a half years. Number seven is the book of Revelation identifies the kingdom. And this we'll see a lot tonight. A lot of times when you hear people talk about the book of Revelation, they'll say, well, you know, Jesus is going to set up his kingdom on earth one day. There's going to be this millennium and Jesus is going to begin reigning as king. Well, what we'll see tonight shows us that Jesus is already reigning as king. Uh, it, it, he was reigning at the time that this was written. Already he was reigning as king. And so we're going to be talking about a spiritual kingdom, not necessarily a physical kingdom. And so uh, we'll see in verse 6 and in verse 9 of chapter 1, that concept tonight. So taking all of this together, just looking at what the book says about itself, trying to build up this structure, what do we conclude? The book of Revelation is about the struggle of the church against the Roman Empire. And within that, we will see this major lesson very clearly that Victory is in Jesus. He is victorious. And if you hold on to Jesus, you will be victorious also with him, in him. And that's a message that 
the church at that time really needed to hear because things were going to get very bad for a while for them. Is that a message that we need to hear today? Right? So this was written about things in the first century, things that were shortly going to come to pass, but does that mean it's without relevance for us? Of course not. Because evil often comes to us out of the same playbook that it's used before, right? Uh, the, the principles of evil here that we see and the principles of God and of victory and holding fast to Jesus, these are all very relevant for you and I today. That's right. And he's making war against us still today. Yes, Brad. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's a great point. There are things in the book of Revelation that are still to come, I believe. Uh, it's still talking about the end of time, the great white throne judgment, for example, uh, the casting of the devil into the lake of fire. This hasn't happened yet. But by and large, the book is about things that they needed to know in their time. And you make a great point, Brad, about uh, 22, Revelation 22, about how Jesus is uh, coming soon, he says. He says that in chapter 1 as well. And um, there also is a sense in which, yes, Jesus is coming at the end of time to bring everything to a close. But Jesus, there are comings of Jesus talked about in the Scripture that are not about the end of time. And I'll show you those tonight and show you a couple of examples. But yeah, there are things that are still to come at the end of this book. And there are, again, principles that we may see things like this again. And there may be uh, principles here that are extended uh, into our day and time or into the future. I could, I could definitely see that. History kind of tends to rhyme, right? The things that you've seen in the past sometimes happen again. So let's, let's dive into chapter 1. Got about 15 minutes, a little less. But let's get started. Revelation 1 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Again, soon to take place, the time is near. And we see in verse 1, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
Revelation means uncovering. There is something that God has revealed or uncovered. He says, which God gave Jesus to show to who? His bondservants. The things which must soon take place. There were things that they needed to know. The things that were going to happen. And how did he communicate these things in verse 1? By his angel, right? To his bondservant, John. And John is testifying to the word of God, to the testimony of Jesus, all that he saw. So this is presented to John as visions. And John is told, write down what you see. And so it's very picturesque language, apocalyptic language, symbolic. John is writing what he sees as it unfolds before him. Look at verse 4. John to the seven churches who are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Who is John addressing here? These are just softball questions. Just keep you looking at the scripture. Who's he addressing? The seven churches in Asia. It's modern day Turkey. Some of these cities are still around. Right? You can tour the, the ruins of them and uh, so on. Uh, so there's uh, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. That's God. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Well, what are these seven spirits? Well, I don't know that I could tell you for sure. And I want to follow my own rule and not speculate. right? But we do have this terminology come up a couple more times in the book of Revelation. I just want to show you those. Um, Revelation 3, 1. We have a reference to the seven spirits there. Um, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this. So Jesus is pictured as having the seven spirits of God. Revelation 4, 5. We have another reference to the seven spirits of God. Out of the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And then again in 5, 6. Revelation 5, 6. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures... And the elders, a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Here we have a lamb, which is Jesus, we'll find out, with seven eyes, which are seven spirits of God that roam throughout the earth, right? He sent them out into all the earth. So you have seven churches and you have seven spirits and maybe the message here is that Jesus sees all. He knows everything that's going on in his churches. Some have seen in the seven spirits of God a reference to the Holy Spirit. There's only one Holy Spirit, right? So why does he talk about seven? Well, it could be, it could be a reference to the completeness of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. But... I couldn't tell you for sure, because the book doesn't say, uh, but it tells us some information about these seven spirits. So come back to chapter 1 and verse 5. What do you learn about Jesus from verse 5? From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us, and released us from our sins by his blood. What do you learn about Jesus? How's he described? Yeah. 
Yeah, he's the faithful witness. And what is he witnessing? It's a great question. Yeah, and remember, God is, yeah, he's witnessing everything. And God has revealed to Jesus so that Jesus could reveal these things to his bond servants. And I think the takeaway here is that if he's the faithful witness, what Jesus says can be trusted. He's faithful. He's true. His testimony is faithful. So every word about this revelation, every word that God gives through Jesus to his servants, we can trust it. How else is Jesus described? He's the firstborn of the dead. Jesus was the first to be raised eternally, to never die again. Jesus is the preeminent one, the first in importance who has been raised from the dead. Jesus overcame death. Now, would that be important for the saints who are going to face persecution to hear? Some of them were going to face death. And to hear Jesus say, I've been raised from the dead. I've died and now I'm alive again. That would be very encouraging for them and for us. He's also described as the ruler of the kings of the earth, as we discussed in the devotional earlier. So despite how everything sometimes look to, looks to us, is Jesus still reigning? You know, if you take this, this track where you say, oh, everything's going to pot, I don't see how Jesus could possibly be reigning. Well, hasn't everything always been like that throughout history? Well, what if you lived in the, king, the time of King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon? How is God reigning? You know, I don't see how this could be true. We have this maniac in charge of the world. Well, was God reigning? Yes. You see it in the book of Daniel very clearly. God was reigning. Wes? There you go. After Israel crossed the Red Sea. Yes. Is he really in charge? Is he really reigning? Right. Right. So the world has, has always been a mess. You know, at times, it's been very, very bad at times in history. But Jesus is ruling. As John writes, Jesus is reigning. We're not waiting for some future reign. He's, he's already reigning as king. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. We just need to trust him. I think that's the message here to the churches. Trust Jesus even if you can't figure it all out. Can't figure out how all the pieces go together. Trust Jesus. It's a great lesson for you and I, too. And it says of Jesus there in verse 5 that He loves us and released us from our sins by His blood. And in everything that was about to happen, they needed to know, Jesus loves me. Present. Present tense. He loves us. Don't ever forget, no matter what you face in life, Jesus loves you, and He will not abandon you. you just got to hold on to Him. Look at verse 6. And He has made us to be a kingdom of priests to His God and Father. To Him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Was there already a kingdom in place when John writes? He has made us to be a kingdom of priests. Each one of us in Christ are a priest of God, a kingdom of priests. And the kingdom was already present and operating at the time of John's writing. Verse 7 Behold, He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over Him. So it is to be. Amen. Now, here we have to ask, are we talking about the second coming? I think perhaps we are. 
But there are comings talked about in the book of Revelation and in other books of the Bible that are not about the end of time. So remember, again, this is things that were going to shortly take place. The time was near. Don't seal up the book. The time is near. Um, and then you look at Old Testament passages that have similar language about God coming in the clouds. Isaiah 19.1 the oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud, and He is about to come to Egypt. The picture of God coming in the clouds. Is this the end of time? No, it's judgment on Egypt. That's Isaiah 19.1. And recall Jesus' words in Matthew 24. He says, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Sounds like the end of time, doesn't it? Jesus coming on the clouds. But then you read just a few verses later in verse 34. Matthew 24, 34. Jesus says, Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. What do you learn? Whatever Jesus was talking about, the Son of Man coming on the clouds, He says, this generation that He's speaking to will not pass away until all of these things take place. And Matthew 24, I firmly believe, is about the destruction of Jerusalem. As Jesus starts the chapter, he walks out and he says, you see all these stones of this temple complex? Not one stone will be left upon another. And one day Jesus is going to come on the clouds, figurative language. But Jesus is actually, literally coming in judgment against Jerusalem with his angels. Yeah. So is this about the end of time here in one, uh, one seven? It, it could be but I'm not sure. It could very well be about the judgment that was coming on the Roman Empire. In fact, if you look at um, Revelation 2.16, Jesus here is addressing the church at Pergamum, which is one of the seven churches. Notice what he says to them in 2.16. Therefore, repent, or else I am coming to you quickly and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. I'm talking about judgment on the church here. And uh, he says, repent, or I'm coming to you quickly. Is this about the second coming, the end of time? Well, no, because if they repent, then he won't come. So we just have to use context to determine, is this about the end of time, or is this about judgment on a nation? Because that kind of terminology is often used about coming judgment, on a nation. Uh, Bob, did you get a count tonight? All right. Thank you. Dave. Right. 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 That's right. You're exactly right. We certainly don't want to lose sight of this fact. Jesus is coming back, isn't he? To, he's coming back to end everything and to bring you know judgment on those who don't know him and don't obey the gospel. It's very true. Matthew 24, uh, verse 30, and then verse 34. So think about that. We do have this terminology of Jesus coming or God coming on the clouds, and it's about judgment on a nation. Patrick.
Right. Right. We need to be ready, don't we? Be ready to meet the Lord. Right. And we need to be ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good thought. Good thought. Well, we're over time, so we'll call it there. Appreciate your thoughts and questions, and we'll see you Sunday, Lord willing.